I'm Benji Canales. Thanks for this opportunity. What a unique uh, and special uh, location for this. Uh, we're going to change topics a little bit, talk about PCNL. I thought for this group, you know, PCNL is a wide topic, but preventing infection, I think, uh, you know, as our last speaker kind of talked about, is always important, as well as uh, I thought about uh, a, uh, a brief uh, stint on obtaining access. So really the first 10 minutes, since we only have 20 minutes, 10 minutes talking about uh, defining what sepsis is, talking about SIRS, all that stuff you guys probably remember uh, way back from residency. And we'll talk about uh, when to use antibiotics, what to use, that sort of thing. And then we'll end with um, getting access to the kidney prone. So PCNL, just out of curiosity, how many people here do PCNLs? All right, wow, so almost everyone. Um, it's ubiquitous, it's the standard of care for large stones, staghorns, greater than two centimeter stones, and then medium sized lower pulse stones as well. Uh, and it's because of the way that we can avoid the ureter. So we all like to not have to put a ureteroscope up for two and a half hours pulling stones out. So it's a great way to avoid the ureter. It also gives you access to uh, patients who have unique anatomies like horseshoe kidneys, ileal conduits, uh, et cetera. So I pulled this off of a uh, immunology review journal was published I think six years ago but it really kind of shows the difference between um, SIRS and infection and again I wanted to find this really well because some of the studies that we talk about are gonna uh, are gonna kind of hedge on this uh, but infection shown here on the left hand side in yellow uh, and I think we all know what infection is uh, but SIRS is a uh, systemic inflammatory response syndrome does it necessarily have to be associated with infection but you can see when this Venn diagram overlaps you get those uh, colored eggs in the middle the green the red and then that purple one which we all fear which is uh, septic shock and then this is the exact same thing just shown in more of a descriptive way um, for my residents they have to know what SIRS is um, and we call it fluter uh, so that's just the way I remember it so it's fever leukocytosis tachycardia and respiratory rate and you really have to have two or more of those to be considered SIRS now again SIRS isn't true on sepsis as you climb up this arrow here, um, this is SIRS with infection is sepsis, uh, SIRS with end organ damage, so liver function, um, abnormalities, uh, AKI, and then of course septic shock, which we all know that's intensive care, that's uh, presser support, maybe even ventilator support. So important to realize that this is a spectrum and not all SIRS is actually necessarily infection. All right, so the reported rates of sepsis, and I just took this, if you look at the bottom, those are all, these are the rates of sepsis that's reported in the literature. One in 200 versus one in four. So how do you get a reported rate of sepsis of one in four to one out of 200? It's mind boggling, right? But if you remember, Fluter, right? Um, there's a variability in that definition. So are you taking two? Are you taking three? Are you taking four? Are you looking at a patient in recovery? Are you looking at them six hours afterwards, 12 hours afterwards? So the definition is important. And also we're dealing with stones. So we all understand, um, hopefully you're taking patients back to the OR and they have sterile urine, but there's bacteria that can be embedded in the stone. And then of course there's dead bacteria that are living on the surface. Those have lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin on the surface. So as soon as you start hitting that stone, whatever technology you're using, that endotoxin can be released. And so you can get a SIRS or septic-like picture, but um, not necessarily have infection. But true urosepsis, we've all seen it, we all fear it. Uh, the mortality, at least historically, is very, very high. So I've just listed some risk factors. Um, the more you read this literature, the more you see there's a variety of things, but most of these make sense to me. So who are the people that are highest risk of having SIRS or sepsis um, um, after surgery? Big staghorn stones, preoperative positive cultures. So intraoperatively, if you're taking four hours, five hours to do your PCNL, it probably is a more difficult surgery. Multiple tracks, if you uh, put a needle in and you get purulence, I mean, all that makes sense intraoperatively. And then post-op, if someone has requires tubes um, prolonged, that's also all kind of makes sense from a, a clinical standpoint to, for, um, for developing sepsis uh, post-op. So I wanted to mention this because it's important. I think for those of us that do a lot of PCNL, this has now become a standard practice. Um, and it's not just urine culture preoperatively, but it's also renal pelvis culture if it's possible and certainly stone culture. Um, how many do stone culture here, just out of curiosity? 
So not as many. And the reason is, not only is it hard, but sometimes you get pushback from hospitals. So I do have a hospital I work at that push back about stone culture, and um, they don't have an SOP, and they don't want to develop an SOP. So I'll just crush a piece of stone, rub it up with a, a swab, and stick it in a, a culture tube and send it. So they have to culture it there. So you really, if there's anything you want to incorporate into your practice is this. So I originally didn't think this was all that important. If you look at the sensitivities and specificities here, it's about a 20% increase in your ability to predict SIRS. And I always said, well, what do I care? I've already done the surgery. What do I care about predicting SIRS? But it's really for post-op management. So if you do a PCNL and a patient has a negative culture and they get septic afterwards, what are you going to treat them with? Well, your, hopefully your stone culture will grow something and most likely they do. And that's what this uh, graph does and the Venn diagram shows that as well. So moving on to guidelines, it's great that we just had a guideline talk. <laughs> this is the AUA best practice statement for uh, percutaneous stone surgery. Uh, so you want to cover GU tract and skin. It's either uh, a first or second generation cephalosporin, or if they have, a let's say, a penicillin allergy, so it would be an aminoglycoside and clinda. And then the, these guidelines say up to 24 hours uh, is what you should cover with. The AUA guidelines say a single either oral or IV dose, and then the EAU guidelines say the length of time is to be determined by you, the practitioner. So anywhere from at the time of surgery to up to 24 hours is pretty reasonable. So I now want to look at two separate studies. Uh, these are high quality studies looking at this question of giving antibiotics before PCNL to prevent uh, sepsis. The first one was published by the EDGE Consortium about four or five years ago. And the first group they looked at was low risk. Who is low risk for sepsis? Well, probably your average Joe, if you will. No drains, negative cultures, just sit in the stone that you're going to um, do a PCNL with. So they randomized 86 patients, the mean stone size of 18 millimeters to either a week of nitrofurantoin or no antibiotics. Um, they define sepsis as again two or more of the fluters and then they also um, added middle status changes and blood pressure changes that were very well defined 12 hours or greater after surgery. So that 12 hour mark is going to decrease the, the kind of your false positives uh, but it's still a pretty broad in inclusion of what sepsis is. Their results basically showed no difference. And I think the surprising thing to all the stone community was the fact that, you know, 12 to 14% sepsis rates after surgery is, is pretty high. Um, and it's certainly not something that I want in my practice. But again, sepsis may be more, a lot more SIRS that they saw than, than true sepsis rates. So that's for a low risk. The same group uh, published just recently on their moderate to high risk individuals. And who are those? Those are people who either have an existing drain, so nephrostomy tube or a stent, or they have a positive preoperative culture somewhere within the last three months. So you are considered high risk for sepsis if you meet these criteria. They randomized 123 PCNL patients, the mean stone size of 22 millimeters, to either two days of nitrofurantoin or seven days. So they were not going to treat these people, but the question was, do you just give them for a few days or for seven days? Exact same sepsis criteria, the fluter again, mental status changes, blood pressure, 12 hours or more. So it's basically the next, uh, starting the next morning after surgery. And their results were a little surprising. So on univariate analysis, nothing came through, and I'll show you their, that table. Uh, on multivariate analysis, the individuals who got seven days of antibiotics had an 11% decrease in their um, sepsis rate compared to individuals who only had two days. And there have been some criticisms of the study, um, not from the study design so much, but more for the patients that got randomized. So here is the two-day group. There was almost a two-fold increase in patients with partial staghorns or full staghorns in the two-day group compared to the seven-day group, and certainly more patients with struvite stone history in the two-day group compared to the seven-day group. But if you just look at univariate analysis, their sepsis criteria greater than 12 hours, no difference positive blood cultures and vasopressor support, no difference. So even though this was a quasi-negative study, the fact that by multivariate analysis was, was positive, most of the folks that do this pretty regularly will treat a week of antibiotics for individuals who um, are in this high-risk group. All right, so Canalis, you've talked about a lot of stuff. I'm going to summarize it here quickly. First of all, the, it's pretty clear, at least single up to 24 hours of antibiotics for um, sepsis prophylaxis. 
You're high-risk individuals who need seven days. It's really positive cultures, drains, or if you suspect struvite stones. And then really try to spare the, uh, your quinolones for um, higher-risk individuals. Try to stay with uh, macrodatinor or uh, trimethoprim. And then for those who get stone cultures, or if you start this in your practice, um, if it grows anything, I continue to give those patients antibiotics until all the tubes are out, because those patients do have a higher risk, and that's shown to have a higher risk of, um, of developing sepsis post-op. All right, we're good? Done with an we're done with, uh, done with infection? Let's go to access. So I love this figure. So this is a Kershid Ghani from Michigan. I show this to all the residents because it's hard when you're a resident in the middle of just getting thrown stuff thrown at you to understand the history behind something. But PCNL's been around a really long time, you know, like 40 plus years. Putting a nephrostomy in afterwards was thought to be heresy, and then three years later, you know, they were doing it regularly, just a plain nephrostomy, not a uh, not large bore. Supine PCNL was first described in 1997. That's like 25 years ago, right? Micro, mini, all this stuff, none of it's new, right? So regardless of who you are, what you do, supine, prone, the one thing that has stayed true this whole time is when you access the kidney, you really want to access perpendicular to the papilla, if possible. To, to miss these, this is your interlobar and your segmental vessels, so uh, to, decrease, uh, to decrease your um, bleeding. So where is Access obtained worldwide. This is data from the Crow study. This is through the Endourology Society. Almost 6,000 PCNLs, and they basically ask people worldwide, where do you get access? About 70% of people get lower pole access, and the majority, 83% of that was below the 12th rib. So it sounds like most people around the world are doing very, very safe PCNLs. Uh, this is the newest data on who gets access, and this is straight out of um, the United States. This was um, University of Washington. This is Ian Metzler. Um, they looked at a market scan database. So this is a database of almost 20,000 PCNLs done over a 10-year period. And they looked at the code 50395, which is your access code. So here in blue is your urology access. In 2007, um, 13% of urologists coded for getting their own access, whereas in 2017, 33% did. So we're either getting our access more or we're coding better for it. <laughs> um, and then they also looked at secondary data. So they looked at all the patients who they could figure out a urologist did access or a radiologist did access. And there was certainly less uh, length of stay, fewer blood transfusions, fewer readmissions, and uh, fewer secondary procedures when the urologist did the access. Now, does that mean we do great access? Maybe not, this is all retrospective. Maybe we uh, cherry pick and select the easier patients to get our access with, get the stones out, whereas we're sending the uh, more challenging um, accesses to our interventional uh, colleagues. But in either case, it does look like your, when urologists get access, it's, it's pretty safe and it's uh, fairly effective. So let's talk about punctures. Um, I prefer to puncture the upper pole, uh, mainly because of these green arrows. It gives you excellent access to almost the entirety of the collecting system. I also think when I'm teaching residents, the upper pole is very forgiving. You can actually puncture laterally or, um, or posteriorly and still not get a lot of bleeding. Um, anything anterior when you're prone is, is not a good place to, to puncture. Uh, but of course, the thing we all fear is, is lungs. So I've written down here anywhere from one to 2% up to 25% pleural injuries. And that's kind of why most people, if, um, if the imaging looks like the, the lung is low, they'll stay away from upper pole. The one downside to upper pole access is you don't, we won't be able to kind of turn your flexible scope behind you. It's really challenging, particularly in small um, kidneys or non-dilated kidneys, to get a flexible scope in that uh, mid pole uh, posteriorly. Lower pole puncture, again, this is probably the most common done around worldwide, and I call it decent access. So here's the green arrows. You get a great view straight down the barrel of, of renal pelvis and also maybe right in front of you in the lower pole. You definitely want to put, puncture a posterior calyx here. Uh, the lower pole is not forgiving. So if you get a lateral or anterior, uh, you're going to get in a mess of bleeding. And then it's basically the least risk to your surrounding organs. The downsides are these yellow arrows. I think it's really challenging, again, teaching residents how to get wires to manipulate wires down and around, particularly if you have a large renal pelvis stone. And then I always worry, you know, they always go in and out and they're trying all different kinds of stuff. This sawing effect on the UPJ, particularly that angle, can be uh, really challenging to, uh, to maneuver. 
And then mid poll, I try never to do this, although I'm gonna show you an axis where we did. Um, I think it gives you okay, so these green arrows, you can get kind of straight down or um, um, to renal pelvis or to lower pole, but you really, it's hard to deflect upper pole and, and lower pole with a flexible scope. Um, and in many cases, you're still above the 12th rib. So if you're trying to avoid going above a rib, that's uh, usually not successful with a, a mid pole stick. So this is what I use. Um, it's called a Wilson frame. I actually stole this straight from our neurosurgeons and orthopedists. When they do um, uh, laminectomies or uh, any kind of kyphoplasties, they actually use this. Uh, it's a fiberglass uh, base um, and it's actually adjustable. There's a little crank and you can actually move this thing backwards and forwards and it um, opens up. They use it to open up lumbar spaces when they're doing uh, spine surgeries. But I love it because the rolls don't move unlike most rolls that roll. <laughs> um, so I use it prone split leg. Uh, I put a lingaman drape, uh, cut the drape, and then uh, this is one of my residents who's putting a flexible cystoscope in. Um, so you can get uh, ureter scopes up, you can get anything you want up. Uh, we do a lot of open-ended catheters with uh, CO2. Um, Maybe a little much for this discussion, but just in general, I tell my residents, kidneys don't sit flat, right? There's never a kidney that sits like a fist just straight up in the air. They're always a little angled and they're always a little turned. So if you're getting upper pole access, you have to rotate the C arm about two degrees towards you. Mid is about seven to 10, and then lower pole access is about 12 degrees. You really have to crank it laterally on the lower pole. And I tried to show that by this little diagram here. All right, so let's look at some cases. So this is a patient of mine. Here's his 12th rib. He's got a big, maybe two and a half centimeter lower pole stone, kind of in this lower pole slash uh, renal pelvis area. Um, this is the original retrograde that I did. Couldn't really tell what that calyx was there, and I'm not really sure I wanted to go here, uh, but I put up an open into catheter, uh, put up just a little bit of CO2, and you can see really beautifully there, that is the posterior lower pole um, area with that I want to puncture. Um, obviously, if you do ultrasound guided, it's the, the, the calyx that's, that's closest to you. Um, but here it makes a lot of sense um, if your, your C-arm is angled, your fluoro is coming in with these red arrows, that the CO2 is going to go up into that posterior calyx. So don't puncture these guys, the ones that are uh, medial. You always want to puncture laterally on the lower pole. All right. Endo-guided access. Anyone here do this? I know Manoj does. Endo-guided. So endo-guided is basically putting up a scope and then perk into the scope. Um, you can imagine you get lots of great views around the kidney that way. Um, you can manipulate stones, so pull stones out of upper pole and put it in the renal pelvis and then access uh, the lower pole. Um, it's known that you get decreased fluoro time, uh, less you know, sticks in and out with needles, and um, it gives you a target. So sometimes, particularly someone whose uh, BMI is very high, it's gonna be really challenging to see a dime-sized uh, area of CO2. So it's very easy to see the end of your ureteroscope. Uh, the other fun thing is you can actually view the balloon. So once you get your wires in place, you pass the balloon, you can visually see the balloon come in and then dilate the track um, as long as it's not too bloody. The downside is you do need two capable surgeons, right? Someone who can run a ureteroscope um, and someone who can stick a needle in the kidney. You do use more disposables. Most of us that do this use a sheath. Um, you do need a specific bed. And then the biggest limitation is if you've got a big ureteral stone or a big renal pelvis stone, you're not going to be able to get a scope into the calyx that you want unless you laser. So um, there are some limitations to it, but it is a, a really great technique. So here's an example where I used it. Uh, this is a patient. Here's his 12th rib. Uh, there's a couple of stones in renal pelvis and lower pole. Uh, I shot some contrast up. Didn't really know exactly where I wanted to go, but uh, pretty easily with a a ureteroscope, I actually found a spot just under the 12th rib. This is the, um, where I said never go, the mid pole calyx. <laughs> um, but you basically uh, pop a needle. This is a Hawkins needle. It's 15 centimeters in length. Uh, you pop it straight down to the tip of the scope and you literally watch the needle come in. That's uh, kind of a fun procedure. Um, these uh, needles have both dull and sharp. So here's an example of what you see when the sharp comes in. Uh, but most of the time you can use the dull and um, it's not so menacing on the inside. 
So we've talked a lot about a lot of stuff from an infection prevention. Again, a single dose up to 24 hours uh, is guideline uh, proven. You do, uh, if you're not doing it now, uh, consider taking, um, if not renal pelvis, because sometimes that's a little hard to do, but certainly a stone culture for, um, certainly for anyone that you're worried about a high risk or just in general. And then you do want to treat your high risk individuals preoperatively, um, as well as stone cultures postoperatively until all the tubes come out. From uh, renal access, I would say embrace the upper Pole, uh, and use rigid nephroscopy. It really makes the case go a lot faster if you're able to use a rigid scope uh, with the lithotriptor. Uh, for fluoro guided access, that FGA, remember access laterally on the lower pole, not any of that medial stuff. And then if you're new to access or if you're interested in just trying it, uh, get a partner in the room with you, have them put up your reader scope and you perk to the scope. Um, it's actually pretty fun. Uh, no PCNL talk would be complete without a warning, so know your limits with PCNL. Bleeding, perforation, frank infection, uh, stop. Uh, but otherwise, um, enjoy perking. Thank you.